Hello, everyone. I'm pleased today to have with me Dr. Robert Trivers. Dr. Trivers is an evolutionary biologist who concentrates on social theory based on natural selection and on evolutionary genetics. These happen to be the backbones of all biology. His early work focused on reciprocal altruism, which we will talk about in some detail today, the evolution of sex differences in all species, the sex ratio at birth, parent-offspring conflict, kinship and sex ratio in social insects, and the theory and a theory outlining the nature of self-deception and its operation in the service of deceit, which in itself can confer, however temporarily, certain advantages. He then devoted 15 years of his life with Austin Burt to reviewing the vast topic of selfish genetic elements in all species, except bacteria and viruses. These are genes that do not benefit the individual with the genes, but spread because they have a within-individual selective advantage. In 2011, he published a popular book, Deceit and Self-Deception, Fooling Yourself, The Better to Fool Others, published in the U.S. as The Folly of Fools. It's been translated into 11 languages, including Korean, Chinese, and Taiwanese, and is widely regarded as a definitive treatment of the subject. In 2015, he published a personal memoir, Wildlife, Adventures of an Evolutionary Biologist, translated into Spanish and Polish. A side note, Dr. Trivers also served as the undergraduate advisor to Dr. Heather Haying and Dr. Brett Weinstein, who are both well-known to the audience that frequents these dialogues. Uh, welcome, Dr. Trivers. It's very good of you to agree to talk with me today. Thank you, sir. So I thought, my, my pleasure, I thought we'd, talk, we'd start with reciprocal altruism. There'll be lots of people who are listening and watching that don't know what that means, and it's a crucial idea. And so I'd like you to outline, well, first to define it, and then to outline your thoughts about it, if you would. Well, um, uh, W.D. Hamilton, who I always regarded as the only uh, greater social theorist, evolutionary social theorist than myself, had already laid out in 1964 uh, in detail the argument for altruistic behavior, so-called altruistic is something that uh, lowers your own reproductive success uh, called fitness. But I never liked the term fitness because it had connotations that uh, uh, could get in the way of your understanding, whereas reproductive success directly described what we're talking about, the number of surviving offspring you, you left. So an altruistic act is one which lowers your production of surviving offspring and raises the production of surviving offspring of the recipient of your altruism. Now, if you're related, then the gene or genes involved may enjoy a net benefit. So, indeed, you're related to your children typically by a half, and yet you invest in them uh, as, a, as a key vehicle to your reproductive success. But uh, Hamilton extended the system laterally so nephews and nieces might not be direct descendants of yours but still you could be related to them by a quarter let's say in which case the benefit would have to be greater than four times the cost for the behavior to be selected so so that was that was uh, the first step now it occurred to me and that was uh, when I started becoming a biologist in 1967. Uh, I took a year as a special student uh, at Harvard to make up for the complete lack of uh, an undergraduate education in biology and was then accepted into graduate school. In any case, I thought it was obvious that there was a second kind of altruism in which I did something nice for you. And at, at a certain point in the future, you did something nice back to me. So it was reciprocal. And as long as benefits were greater than costs, 
which one assumes they would be. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't be selected under any regime for them. Uh, then there could be a net benefit of this transfer. The problem with reciprocal altruism was what happens with the so-called cheater. That is, the system automatically selects for someone that receives the benefit but doesn't bother reciprocate. Uh, well, if they don't reciprocate at all, you cut off any future altruism toward him. And so uh, each act of uh, failure on their part results in a source of altruism being cut off. So the more interesting phenomenon is where you cheat. That is, you give back less than you got, but you're still giving back a benefit. So uh, they still receive a benefit. They just don't receive the benefit that they, quote, ought to or would if the uh, system was egalitarian and fair. And those words, fair and just and so on, I felt actually emerged from a reciprocal altruism precisely because they evaluated uh, the costs uh, uh, inflicted versus the benefits received. Uh, so you had subtle cheaters, which reciprocated to a degree and enough so that you enjoyed a net benefit, but not as much as you, quote, deserved. And so that was the dynamic of reciprocal altruism, was the, the cheater. Uh, uh, detector, detection of the right, cheater so, so. wasn't so difficult, but uh, how to interact with the individual so as to change his or her behavior, that was an inter more interesting uh, problem. So uh, a colleague, uh, I think a graduate student at Harvard, had happened to write a paper reviewing the emotions associated with altruistic behavior. He didn't have any particular theoretical orientation or evolutionary, but uh, he reviewed the subject. And I remember going to him. I took a class on morality, something like that, uh, specifically in order to learn enough about uh, human behavior related to reciprocity to flesh out my paper. But uh, there, uh, first class, I saw that the graduate student who was a teaching assistant had already written a paper uh, doing exactly what I hoped to uh, learn by sitting in on a class. So I went to him and asked if I could uh, uh, sit and read his paper, uh, let's say, in his office and take notes. And he said, uh, hell, I'll give you a copy. And I thought, uh, almighty God. Uh, that's an act of altruism <laughs> that I can surely benefit from. And so he gave me a copy. I promptly dropped out of the course and actually uh, molded the s second half, i.e. The, 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 the content of my paper uh, in the different categories were just drawn straight out of his work and reorganized a bit so as to fit the logic I was pushing. I hope that's not so, too, too complicated or too much detail. No, no, no it's, it's exactly right. So, so w why concentrate specifically on reciprocal altruism? I mean, obviously tied up in that is, is, is cooperation, mutual benefit, and then also you discuss the problem of cheating and cheating deception or detecting cheating. And deception, of course, is a way of 
making cheating difficult to detect. And so you're you're focusing your biological inquiry on what we would intuit as moral issues, moral issue associated with cooperation, the moral issue associated with deviation from that cooperation. Is that a reasonable way of looking at what you're what you've been doing? Uh, well, what I did uh, when you say what I've been doing, I actually did write a paper called Reciprocal Altruism 30 years later and tried to uh, um, bring the subject up to date. But in general, I didn't do that on any of my papers. That is, I wrote the paper and that was it. I wrote a paper on parent offspring conflict. I don't think I've ever written a second one. I wrote a paper on haplodiploidy and the evolution of social insects, uh, where I, I took uh, kinship theory, Hamilton's kinship theory, and applied it rigorously to the unusual situation of ants, bees, and wasps, where males are, only have one set of chromosomes, they're haploid, and females have two, they're diploid. And that leads to unusual degrees of relatedness. Indeed, it's the only case in nature uh, other than identical twinning where you're more related to someone other than your own offspring, namely uh, full sisters. In a haplodiploid system, you're related to them by three quarters, but you're only related to your brothers by one quarter. So it cancels out to give you half. And that's how people thought about it for a couple of years. But it's obvious to me that uh, uh, you don't average them. If one is three quarters and the other is a quarter, then you're selected to invest much more heavily in those that you're related by three quarters and much less in those that are you're related to by one quarter. How do you envision the relationship between reciprocal altruism and the structures of society and the moral structures that guide society? I mean, I would almost be thinking off the top of my head. It's been quite some time since I've thought about it. Uh, you mentioned in your introduction that I peeled off 15 years of my life or whatever it was to master selfish genetic elements. Uh, that's selection below the level of the individual. Uh, Hamilton was conscious of it. Uh, but uh, it was Austin Burt, my co-author, who was the first to see uh, really deeply into the literature and start to reorganize it. Uh, so the entire subject of uh, genetics, uh, evolutionary genetics, was reorganized around the concept of selfish genes and the conflict they have with others, uh, both between closely related individuals and within individuals. So now you're asking me the relationship between reciprocal altruism and sort of society-wide phenomenon and so on. And I can't, I can't boil it down to a simple argument. Yep. In 2002, which was the selected papers of Robert Trivers, uh, not the collected because it wasn't worth everything, uh, just the selected. But I did something uh, unique. Generally, for selected or collected papers, people would write a, a short introduction to how they happened to write the paper, and then you would get the paper. And then there would be a short introduction for your next paper and then the paper. What I added was what you're asking for, which is uh, 
I would write a short introduction, then the paper. Then there would be a short section on progress since then, uh, since the paper is published. Uh, that was often fairly brief. Um, and uh, I can't remember what I said about uh, reciprocal autism. Now I'd, I would have to go get the book to uh to check it out but i'm afraid i don't have I, i'm afraid i can't reason for you at the level you would like in terms of reciprocal altruism and societal organization and so on i think it's obvious that societies are not i mean they're they may be partly based on kinship, but uh, uh, only partly, and and often much more on patterns of cooperation that uh, evolve or are generated and sustain themselves. Why would you stress cooperation as a basis for social organization, say, rather than competition? Or kinship, for that matter. Well, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's it's partly just uh, you know what was available at the time when I wrote on reciprocal altruism. If you wanna, if you wanna bring it all the way back to the evolution of reciprocal altruism, which was my first paper published, uh, and indeed Harvard broke their usual rule, and they allowed me, uh, I just had a, a thesis that consisted of three chapters. One was reciprocal altruism, the other was parental investment and sexual selection. Then Harvard had a rule that you had to have at least one chapter that was empirical, uh, and that meant lab work, which I had no intention whatsoever of doing i knew nothing about labs and i had no ability there or field work well now field work is uh, much more congenial especially if you're interested in social behavior social theory so watching baboons which i did with herb devore in uh kenya and tanzania back in 72 or going to uh, Haiti and then Jamaica with my advisor, Ernest Williams, who was the expert on tree climbing lizards. So in fact, I did my third chapter on the green lizard, uh, the largest of the Enola's tree climbing lizards. There are seven species. Well, there's really eight, uh, in Jamaica. Uh, so I had to go back down to Jamaica at regular intervals i would come back to harvard and 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 work for three months during the semester of teaching and so on then you'd get a month between semesters and i would fly down to jamaica and that set up a lifelong bond between me and jamaica where i've lived uh at least 20 years of my life uh married onto the island or stole a woman off the island as another Jamaican expression, and uh, have four children by her. Dr. Trivers, how did you get interested in deception? And how did you get interested in deception and then in self-deception and the relationship between the two? Let me step back one second, sir. You asked about uh, competition versus cooperation. Uh, yes. I mean, you competition even applies between different cooperative enterprises. They cooperate within their entity, but they compete with other similarly structured entities uh, so as to maximize their reproductive success. Uh, now, competition was well known. I mean, it was the, the basis of life where we're out there competing all the time. Uh, cooperation was um, a subtler problem, which you had to figure out what the 
competitive natural selection advantage was. So now you just asked about deceit and self-deception, but sir, I'm afraid, uh, uh, blame it on uh, 78 years of uh, mentation, if you will. Uh, I, I do know that by 76, in other words, reciprocal altruism was 71, parental investment was 72, uh, Trivers and Willard, uh, which was an interesting theory about uh, tending to produce sons under these conditions and then uh, daughters under these conditions. So, for example, if you look at a human hierarchy, uh, people at the top end tend to produce sons uh, with higher frequency, but people at the bottom end tend to produce daughters at higher frequency. Well, Every child has a mother and a father. So we know that the aggregate reproductive success of females must equal the aggregate reproductive success of males. So if high class males are doing better, then it makes sense that lower class women are doing better. So as to balance out the equation. And so they get some advantage of uh, these men, i.e. they mate with them. Um, now, um, I wrote, I wrote the foreword or, or something like that for some book in 1975 or 76, and I'm afraid it slipped my brain, but I slipped in the theory of uh, deceit and self-deception there. Uh, just There were just two sentences in there. Something about, uh, you know, deception's obviously favored, but, uh, um, you know, the best way to hide it, it, it from others is, first of all, to hide it from yourself. And then you don't give off any of the cues that uh, are associated with deception. Incidentally, I, I have paid attention to the literature on cues, and it's very interesting to me that the, the most general uh, cue for deception is a slight raise in your pitch of your voice. That seems to be all but universal. <laughs> uh, so if, if you can listen carefully enough to hear when someone's voice rises a bit, they're more likely to be practicing uh, deception. So I practiced as a clinician for a long time and as a research psychologist, and I was very interested in how people s deceived themselves and the kinds of psychopathologies that emerged. And so here's a, here's a hypothesis. Let me ask you what you think of it. What I noticed often was that when people received information that contradicted one of their explicit beliefs, the information often manifested itself emotionally. And so imagine that a husband comes home with lipstick on his collar and the wife sees that and becomes agitated as a consequence, but then refuses to think through what the implications of that might be. And so the self-deception isn't one fully thought out proposition versus another, it's a fully thought out set of propositions, say about marital stability, or at least partially thought out, versus an emotional cue of uncertain significance that has to be unpacked with difficulty. And avoidance of that is tantamount, at least to some form of self-deception. How does that strike well, you? Well, I get lost in your argument there. Go, go back to your example. Uh, well, there's, there's lipstick on his uh, collar. 
Right. And now she has a vision in her mind of, let's say, marital stability and harmony. And it's pretty fleshed out. But now all she's got that contradicts that is one piece of visual evidence and an emotion, which might be anger, anxiety, and so forth. And she can hold on to her pre-existing belief with no work. In order to transform that belief, she's going to have to do a tremendous amount of exploration and investigation. And so Wait she can second. just not do that. What yep. is her yep. pre-existing, quote, belief here? I'm, I'm getting lost already. It might be a fantasy of marital harmony. Okay, so she has a fantasy of marital harmony. She has a piece of evidence that's inconsistent with marital harmony. Now what? Well, there's a very large potential range of meanings of that piece of evidence. And so for her to transform that into something differentiated enough to alter her fantasy would take a tremendous amount of effort. And so she can just not do that. And that's passive self-deception, which I think is the most common passive kind. Passive self-deception? Yes. You know something's up. You know there's an elephant under the carpet, but you decide not to look. So I'm getting confused now. You've already seen it. You've seen the lipstick there. So you've seen evidence th that suggests that uh, he's in a semi-intimate relationship with another woman, at least to the point of kissing her or being kissed by her. Now I'm confused with what you're saying. She's put a lot of time and effort into the theory of her marriage that she already holds. So it's it, the idea that that marriage is stable and loving, let's say, is a predicate for many of her memories. It's a presumption for many of her current activities, and it's the basis for her future plan. And so to investigate that means that she would have to go through all the work of modifying all those representations. It's not like the evidence contains that modification. It's just an error message. It's hard to unpack an error message. What's the error message? Well, the error message would be the lipstick and then the negative emotion that goes with its, with its visual apprehension. What's the error? The error is that the presumption of her fantasy that her marriage is stable and loving and, let's say, also monogamous. So that's an error, you're saying, and now she's got a message that she's in error. So now what's the... Right, but that's all she has. That's the problem, right? And all she has is a message that she's in error. It doesn't contain much other information. And it's going to be extremely hard for her to reconstruct all that theorizing she's done based on the assumption, erroneous assumption of monogamy. And so it's easiest just not to do it. Yes, and then what's the cost of her not doing it? Well, I would say the immediate cost is virtually nothing. And that's another advantage. But the long-term cost is that she's building a future reality based on a mispresumption. And so she can't... She may make errors, for example, about her financial security going into the future or even the presence of her partner. And that's a huge potential cost. She's going to underestimate, for example, the danger of divorce, or of him leaving. In order to avoid facing the, uh, the pain and the, uh, and the... Yes, well, and I think, it, I think this idea maps onto your hypothesis that at times, the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere can be delivering contradictory messages. So, if the left is linguistic and generates up detailed propositional arguments, let's say, that get held with some certainty, and the right emotionally signals error, then there's a tremendous amount of work that has to be done in order to 
unpack that error and remake all those propositional pre- presumptions. It's really well, that's, hard. That's what I don't understand in your argument. I don't understand why there's a huge amount of work where she's got to unpack a whole endless series of uh, uh, assumptions or arguments just because it is one thing. All right, let's let's go back to the to the situation. We know that the guy is involved with at least one other Another. woman, and we know that it's you know he's tended to conceal it, uh, as would be natural, so as to uh, so as to not result in marital conflict. Now he messes up. Um, it seems okay. to me, I mean, she has a simple decision that she confront him over it and say, uh, Joe, what the hell is this? Or confront him whatever way she wants to. Okay. So imagine the, imagine the complexity of that confrontation. And, and this is the sort of thing that I saw a lot in my clinical practice. So because he lied about that, she no longer knows whether anything he's told her or anything he's done is true or real. It, because she's violated this basic presupposition of trust. And so part of the reason she's going to have a major emotional reaction to that is that she now doesn't know whether she can trust anything about him and may have to reevaluate all her perceptions of him, even those that are part of the past. Yeah, go ahead. So what? Well, so there's a tremendous amount of work associated with that. You know, and, and part of what our certainties do, as far as I can tell, is inhibit anxiety and doubt almost by definition. And so now if you've discovered that you can't trust someone because they violated a fundamental presumption, then every, th- every part of the way you look at the world that's predicated on that trust has now become unstable. Well, now that, that is a, such a strong statement. You say everything that is associated with that violation of trust is now subject to reevaluation and so forth and so on. That's, I don't know, you, you know, you're the, the, the foundation of your argumentation towards me and I respect it is that you uh, have clinical experience dealing with people who come to you and talk to you about these kinds of things. So you know. I think that's a good objection. And so let me, let me propose something in relationship to that, because I think that's a crucial objection that you made. So one of the things that I wrestled with formulating when I was thinking about self-deception was the relationship of one belief to another. So imagine that, and this is something you could object to, imagine that some beliefs are more fundamental than others, and that fundamentalness or is a reflection of how many other beliefs depend on that belief. It's like a definition of fundamental. It's a hierarchy. And so some beliefs are trivial, because almost nothing depends on them, but other beliefs are absolutely fundamental because everything that you're doing depends on their validity. And so then... Everything? Well, depending on how deep the belief is. Eating dinner? Come on, brother. Well, okay, but... uh, uh, Fair enough. Good objection. But, you know, if you deal with someone who's profoundly depressed because they've something that was crucial to them was devastated, they will often have a tremendous amount of difficulty doing even those basic things. That's true, brother. I I grant you that people can suffer to the point where 
they got a problem eating. They've got a problem digesting. I mean, the, the actual digestive system uh, may be hindered or altered by the kind of mental stress or mentation that's going on. Let me give you an example of that in, with depression. Go ahead. So this is often what, okay, this, this is often what happens with people who are very depressed. Let's say they have a minor argument with their, their son, someone they love, just a minor argument. And then they think, well, I acted really badly in that argument. I really hurt my son's feelings. Only a terrible person would hurt someone's feelings. I must be a terrible person. I'm a terrible person now, and I'm going to be a terrible person in the future, and there's nothing that can be done about it. And that's the sort of thinking that leads to suicide. And you can see the person going down the hierarchy of their beliefs, right? From, from the little argument, which is nothing, all the way down to something that is so basic to their self-concept that if it's challenged, they want to die. That happens a lot in de real depression, real severe depression. That, that happens continually. It, it's almost like the hallmark of the illness. Well, that's, that's interesting. I have been thinking about depression, uh, you know, personally. I was presenting that conception of depression, you know, that, that cascade of doubt that I outlined as an illustration of what people are motivated to avoid when they practice self-deception. They don't want to start unraveling because they don't know where the unraveling will end. So they're afraid of that. And that's partly why they won't investigate. Yes, I, 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 you know, off the top of my head, I would agree with that kind of argument that uh, uh, they don't want to pursue uh, reality very far uh, when it's easier to flip, flip part of it and uh, be unconscious or uh, try to become unconscious of the flip you're making. School's out for the summer, but if your business is running QuickBooks, you'll never get a break. That's why I'm here today to tell you about NetSuite. NetSuite's single unified database system makes tracking down numbers across departments easy. On the other hand, QuickBooks manual processes, integration difficulties, and glitchy delays will leave you scrambling for the numbers you need. And 93% of surveyed businesses increased their visibility and control since graduating from QuickBooks to NetSuite. So failing to graduate to NetSuite means you'll be stuck in data traffic while the party starts without you. NetSuite by Oracle is the world's number one cloud ERP, enterprise resource planning, no matter how big your business grows or where you are. With visibility and control of your financials, inventory, HR, e-commerce, and more, NetSuite is everything you need to support your business as it grows all in one place. They support over 31,000 customers in 217 countries and territories around the world. Regardless of where you are, automate your processes with NetSuite so you can close your books in no time. Right now, NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind financing program, so graduating has never been easier. Head to netsuite.com slash jbp right now. That's special financing at netsuite.com slash jbp. netsuite.com slash jbp. Now, in your book on self-deception, you outlined some of the social costs of self-deception, say, in relationship to warfare, and talked about the way that the biases that we have to perhaps reject contradictory information can produce catastrophic consequences, say, at the policy level. Said, for example, that leaders and the people that they purport to lead are often extremely over-optimistic at the beginning of a war and also have a proclivity to derogate and minimize the strength of their enemy. And you link... So, when you did your work on self-deception, did you draw any ethical conclusions from it? Did, I mean, and as an evolutionary biologist, you see it as a strategy in, in a sense. 
but it's a strategy that has a lot of costs. Initially, I was very much down on both deception and self-deception. I was very much biased towards the truth and honesty. Uh, then, I think when I saw uh, the degree to which uh, deception was advantageous, you, you mentioned in the book having lots of examples uh, from other animals of deceptive behavior and, and even morphology. Uh, and then self-deception, I was against, you know, doubly, if you will, uh, because you're deceiving yourself. So you're both the victim and the victimizer, as I imagined it. Uh, then I came to kind of relax about both of them. I saw situations in which deception is something I would practice uh, consciously, you know. But again, uh, it, it might have to be a fairly serious situation in which you would have to construct a serious lie to get out of it. And I know there have been situations in my life uh, not too, too long ago, where I've spent a lot of time constructing a deception that gives off the minimal amount of cues so that it's hard to detect, if you will. When I walked my clients through situations where they had to construct deceptions to avoid let's say, some serious consequence, or maybe to gain some serious advantage, which often backfired in the long run, one of the things that seemed useful to do was to trace back into their story the events that led to the necessity of the deception. In, I, there's a Canadian songwriter who wrote a line that, struck me in this regard. He said, there is no decent place to stand in a massacre. And my response would be, well, you should unpack the actions that led you to be there to begin with, right? Because sometimes there's no good way out of something, but there might have been a good way of not having it arise in the first place. <laughs> There's no decent place to stand in a massacre. Uh, does that include the victims? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? You know, if you've been a victim, let's say, you've been a victim, and genuine victim, I, th I saw this in my clinical practice a lot as well. Despite the genuineness of your victimization, it still might be useful asking yourself, if you did anything that you could change that increased the probability of that victimization. Increase the probability that it did happen? Yes, that you were victimized. You know, you, you might say, for example, you might want to address your vulnerabilities. You know, so here, let me give you an example, okay? Imagine that you... I had clients like this. They were women who had been in sequential abusive relationships. Yes. Okay, so they were victims and often of extremely violent and sometimes psychopathic men. Yes. And what, but what I would help them do, because I couldn't deal with the psychopathic men, they weren't there, was to unpack elements of their actions and assumptions that might have increased the probability that they would enter into those relationships. I can remember cases, uh, though not in much detail now, where I noticed a, a particular woman who seemed to go from uh, abusive relationship to abusive relationship. So she would sometimes flee abuse, an abusive relationship literally by uh, changing the city she lived in. This is in the U.S. But then what was so striking to me was I would visit her or see her. 
she was not an intimate uh, uh, a friend of mine, uh, but a close friend, if you will, or potentially close friend. And I would see, by God, she's she's gone and found somebody else uh, that's abusive in this new situation. So she's drawn to them in some way, or at least she's not averse to them. You know, she 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 doesn't have her guard up, and she may indeed. Um, be attracted to some element of them that is associated with them being abusive. I'm sure, given your clinical practice, you must have examples of this kind of stuff. Here's something to think about in that regard. Oftentimes, women who find themselves in those situations aren't sophisticated enough, for one reason or another, to distinguish between power aggression, and competence. And so when they see someone acting aggressively, they infer competence. Uh -huh. So part of unpacking that would be to help them distinguish between those two, to know that there is a distinction between the raw expression of power and competence. Well, there's and then certainly, there's another, certainly is. I, I had no idea that that was a that that confusion was involved in uh, in the behavioral problem we're talking about. Uh, but certainly, Jesus Christ, there's, there's a difference between uh, competence and abuse. Okay, well, let me, I was speaking with um, an evolutionary psychologist, David Buss. Yes. Just yesterday. And David Buss has looked at the relationship between dark triad behavior so that's narcissism machiavellianism and aggression i might have the third one wrong but that's basically it now younger women younger inexperienced women are much more likely to be attracted to dark triad guys and that's partly as far as i can tell because they haven't had the experience to distinguish between narcissism let's say and success and the confidence that comes with success and that's an example of that inability to distinguish between aggression and competence now the aggression might be necessary to deal with free riders and cheaters so you're saying are you that some of these aggressive men might be attractive to women precisely because they would be hard on the malevolent types you're talking about I'm yes just... exactly exactly that uh -huh. um the capacity for male aggression is necessary and it's part of what makes men attractive to women you can see that in their fantasies so the most common forms of pornographic fiction that women read feature surgeons, pirates, vampires, billionaires, and unfortunately, I can't remember the other one, but, but they're men who have, you could say power, but that's not it. I don't believe that. I believe it's something like competence and the ability to use aggression when necessary. And then the narcissistic men, they're parasitizing that in some sense they're mimicking that and that's why they're attractive to inexperienced women mm -hmm. plausible sure when i see the political arguments that take place now the accusation that the male hierarchy is a let's say, oppressive patriarchy, right? An exploitative structure. What I see in that is partially this inability to distinguish between power and competence and also to under failure to understand when aggressive action is necessary and desirable. And that, and that seems related to the free rider problem. Yes, I hear you. No objections to that? <laughs> uh, none so far. <laughs> All right, so let, let me go back to the idea of belief dependencies. 
So, you know, we all say that some things are more important to us than others. We hold them more dear. So, it, the integrity of those core beliefs, I think, is related to, directly to the inhibition of negative emotion. Inhibition of what? Of, ne of negative emotion. Anxiety, particularly, and doubt. So, the beliefs that are more important to us are beliefs that other beliefs depend on, and when they're threatened, it's very emotionally destabilizing. And very hard on us from a physical perspective as well. Because when our core beliefs are disrupted, we don't know what to do, and therefore we have to prepare to do everything. That's the emergency response, right? It's, that's fight or flight, I suppose. But it's very physiologically costly. And so I think sometimes people engage in self-deception so that they don't have to undermine their core beliefs and, and dysregulate themselves like that. That seems plausible to me, sir. The unfortunate problem seems to be that the long-term consequences of that are often not good. You know, you ignore a profound danger at your peril. It saves you from the psychophysiological exhaustion in the present, but if the problem is really there, things unravel really badly in the future. Yes. So, we could say that self-deception has its advantages, uh, even as an adaptive strategy. And I think the idea that it can serve deception as a handmaiden, say, is a powerful idea, but it doesn't look like it's an optimal strategy. And, and so one of the things I wanted to ask you is, is there justification in evolutionary biology for, you know, you said strategies compete, right? And so does that mean that there is an optimal strategy that, that we approximate, that we, that we have an intuition of even? God, I would tend to doubt that there's an optimal one. First of all, if there were an optimal strategy, why isn't everybody uh, adapting it, adopting it? Uh, well... You may answer me by saying, well, uh, it's adaptive, but not in all situations. Fine. But uh, if it's always adaptive in these situations, you would expect them to get matched up together fairly quickly over time, wouldn't you? Th that's a good objection. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a tough one, right? I mean, you, you've also talked about runaway sexual selection. Okay, so uh, this is an answer to the problem you just posed, possibly. I mean, one thing that does seem to have been selected for that operates across a very wide range of contexts, at least in human beings, is something like general intelligence. You know, and the cortical expansion that produced that, and that's been selected by women. So I would say, as a domain general, there's a domain general ability that might have been selected that that worked in most situations and that was more intelligence at least with humans that that doesn't address the ethical issue exactly and you said it was mostly being selected by women female choice well they're choosier yes and they're they're socially brighter and they're also they are also less likely to agree that a low intelligent sexual partner would be acceptable, according to um, David Buss, the evolutionary psychologist I was speaking with just yesterday. So they are, women do appear to be exerting more selection pressure on general cognitive ability. But I also wonder if there's not an ethical equivalent to that, that something like, well, the capacity for reciprocal altruism 
So what's your what what are you then saying that females uh, are a positive selective force for uh, reciprocal altruism? I'm I'm un- Well, uh, yeah. Well, I'm. That's not as strong an argument as the one for let's say intelligence. It's harder to define the central element of reciprocal altruism than the central element of intelligence. It's harder technically, but you know the, there is an idea in 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 evolutionary biology sort of implicit that women select men who are higher as high as they can manage in the status hierarchy and that hierarchy is constructed as a consequence of the exercise of power and i think that's wrong and and dangerous that idea i don't think those hierarchies the male hierarchies that influence female selection are based on power I think they're based on something more like competence. And I think it's associated with this capacity for reciprocal altruism. Because you want him, if you're a woman, you want a man who's productive, but also generous. Certainly, I don't have anything to say against what you just said. Um, I don't know what David Buss was arguing. Well, I would say something similar. I mean, you're... Your book on deception and self-deception is very interesting because you point out in many, many ways how deception can confer at least a temporary advantage, but often a more permanent advantage. And so it makes making the case that, let's say, something like honesty is selected for much more difficult. But I also wonder if there's a utility in differentiating between deception and mimicry in animals. No, terminologically. But I don't understand uh, why mimicry is not an example of deception. Let's say we're talking about moths or butterflies and uh, predators, birds, So you will have some uh, butterflies that are perfectly tasty to birds, uh, but there are a couple that are not, that have a poison uh, that they ingest uh, when they're caterpillars, which they retain in adulthood so that they're distasteful. And poisonous. So then they attract, so to speak, mimics. Because now, if you're a related species, uh, so you're similar in appearance already, but you don't happen to have the poison, then you evolve to be, to resemble that species more and more in order to gain the benefit that they have from having the poison. So the the predator makes the assumption that you've got the poison because you look exactly like the species that has the poison. And then they've done work, but I, you know, it's long ago disappeared from my memory. They've done work on the relative frequency of the two kinds. And there are situations in which the mimic can be, you know, five or ten times as frequent as the model, as they're called, and they're gaining a benefit, and they're inflicting a marginal cost on the model. There are other situations in which, as they rise in number, the mimic, uh, they inflict a cost on the model because now birds uh, snap the model. Of course, they spit it out, but that doesn't uh, help the model. Uh, that just means the, well, the bird doesn't swallow the poison. You could make a similar case for narcissists. It, imagine that the model is someone competent and confident and maybe assertive because of that, and productive and generous, but the mimic 
just mimics the confidence and assertiveness. And then there is a cost inflicted on the model, because if there are enough narcissistic mimics, then the existence of the model starts to become doubtful. You're absolutely right. And there's a, there's a rich literature on that. And I used to study it very carefully because I was interested in the, you know, the interaction between deception and detection of deception. And of course, you toss in self-deception to bypass the initial, the initial problem. Did I tell you about uh, the, the fact that uh, deceivers have a slightly higher pitch to their voice? Yes, you mentioned you mentioned that. That's it's, very uh, interesting. Very, Any, very general. Do you know anything about the physiological mechanisms? Is that a stress response, or did anybody study why that is? It's stress due to fear of detection. Okay, that's believed to cause you to to contract your your belly. Uh, when you're making a sound, and so it, 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 it rises in pitch. As a side note, an interesting story from your book. You, you talked about one species of butterfly that could lay five different kinds of eggs to mimic five different kinds of poisonous butterfly species. Right. So let's talk about mimicry for a minute and deception. Because it's such, they're so tightly interwoven. Human beings are very imitative. And so, someone growing up can choose to mimic a particular model, let's say. And that model might be someone competent, or it might be someone narcissistic. And so, you could mimic competence and become competent, or you could mimic narcissism and become narcissistic. And that's partly why I think maybe there's a useful distinction to be made between mimicry and deception. I mean, not, not in the cases you raised with the butterflies, but in the human case, because there are psychological mechanisms involved, the, the problem becomes a lot thornier. What's the definition of a narcissist? You can define it by personality. So, narcissists tend to be extroverted, a lot of positive emotion, and disagreeable. So, very little empathy and more likely to be aggressive. So, and that is a masculine pattern to some degree because men are more extroverted than women, especially in, extra, in, in assertiveness. And they're less agreeable than women. It's the extremes, though. When you get the extremes there, you have something like temperamental narcissism. And then if they're low in conscientiousness, that's even worse. Because then, well, they're neither productive nor dutiful nor honest. None of those. And maybe that's psychopathy. Maybe. It's, it's not clear. And then you could think about it socially, is that a narcissist is someone who assumes his or her status is higher than those around them would claim. There's a, there's a, there's a very important literature on psychopaths. Now, when you talk about Donald Trump, uh, if you call him a psychopath, then people will tell you, no, no, no. He's a narcissistic sociopath. And I'll say, well, I don't care about terminology. Uh, there is no scientific literature uh, that I know of on narcissistic sociopaths. I'll come back real quickly now to the literature on psychopaths, because I, I found I, I, it was transformative when I read these papers. They were written by uh, Canadian mathematicians, and there was a psychopathic scale uh, that someone had invented. 
Robert Hare, I believe, invented the scale. Well, psychopaths, are, there are violent psychopaths, and they are, of course, of a considerable danger, uh, but they are outnumbered by nonviolent psychopaths. And their the definition, I think, has to do with uh, uh, lack of uh, empathy, lack of feeling for others. Well, what I've got written down here is the key to understanding Donald Trump is that he is a psychopath held at one to three percent frequency in a population where it becomes highly evolved to prey on the large population while the population is much more weakly selected to resist. Key scientific paper, Krupp et al. I believe the paper you're referring to is Nepotistic Patterns of Violent Psychopathy, Evidence for Adaptation. So they were positive towards relatives. Now, um, whether Krupp et al. also did the held at a one to three percent frequency in a population, um, there, the notion was that the psychopath is held in a frequency dependent equilibrium. In other words, mm. it doesn't go down to zero because when there's only one percent that's a psychopath, they're positively selected compared to the general population. However, when they reach 3% frequency, they're already bumping up against the upper boundary. So they're selected. You could also imagine that when their frequency declines in a given population, that people are much less alert to the possibility of psychopathy. And so then the deceptions that they engage in are less likely to be detected and they spring back into existence. Well, yes, but remember that, that that's automatically true about these uh, psychopaths because they're held between a 1% to 3% frequency, which is low. As I, as I mentioned in that just uh, the little paragraph there, in other words... Uh, there, <laughs> when you're a psychopath, you're always appearing and, uh, and, uh, but the, the percentage is only one to 3%. Whereas, well, um, the population itself is only experiencing a psychopath, uh, once every several generations. Um, so selection is bound to be weaker on the detect detectors of psychopaths, although the fact that uh, it doesn't rise above a 3% frequency does suggest that at, at that frequency, there's too damn many of them. And so people start paying attention and saying, damn, there's there's Donald Trump, there's Donald Trump Jr., there's uh, uh, whatever the hell his daughter's name was, uh, who thought she was going to be uh, head of uh, some big uh, EU <laughs> organization. Uh, anyway, that was Trump. The fact that you just laid out, too, that... Even when psychopaths are relatively successful in a population, they don't exceed 3%. Also indicates that that psychopathic exploitation, which might be regarded as the purest expression of arbitrary selfish power, is actually not a very good strategy. Well, <laughs> I'd, rather, I'd rather be the part of the 97% that uh, <laughs> uh, wasn't a psychopath. Hello, everyone. I would encourage you to continue listening to my conversation with my guest on dailywireplus.com.